And in connection with the Independence Day holiday, we're examining a very notable historical event that's also connected, obviously, with gaining independence, the exodus of Israel from Egyptian captivity some 3,400 years ago. And in addition to being one of the most memorable stories of the Bible, it has a remarkable parallel to our liberation today from sin and from the clutches of the devil. Now we left off this morning with the Hebrews preparing for a new life to leave Egypt for good and to literally experience a new life, a new beginning, a fresh start following 430 years of captivity. But first, before that could happen, Pharaoh had to be convinced to let the people go. And God sent nine plagues in an effort to convince him. But it wasn't enough. One more, and if you let me use the expression, one more straw was required to break not so much the camel's back, but Pharaoh's back. And it was a very dramatic drastic straw. It was the death of the firstborn in Egypt, not just of man and woman, but also of the animals. And as far as we know, that would, this would be the firstborn males of the families. We believe that's the case because in Exodus 4 verse 23, God is speaking to Moses about what he is to tell Pharaoh, and this is part of the message. Let my son, now this would be the nation, because they were God's children. Let my son go that he may serve me. But if you refuse to let him go, indeed, I will kill your son, your firstborn. Which is exactly what would happen. The only problem or complication, I should say, that God had is when he passed throughout Egypt, he wanted to spare the firstborn of the Hebrews. But for that to happen, they had to do something special, very special, and very challenging. And they had to do exactly what God instructed. So let's pick up with Exodus chapter 12 and verse 3. We covered part of this this morning, but that's fine. So here's what God told Moses. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying on the tenth day of this month, every man shall take for himself a lamb, according to the house of his father, a lamb for a household. And then in verse 5, your lamb shall be without blemish, a male of the first year. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. Now you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation shall kill it at twilight. And they shall take some of the blood and put it on the doorposts and on the lintel of the houses where they eat it. And then God explains, now the blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you are. And I'd, I'd like to explore that further. It was really more for the benefit of the Hebrews, that sign. Now God had to see it, certainly, but it was something for their benefit, a sign for them. God continues, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. And the plague shall not be on you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. I asked this morning, why would God instruct the Hebrews do such, to do such a cruel, I guess we would call it a heartless thing, to this helpless, innocent land? To teach the Hebrews. At least two things. Number one, freedom always comes at a price. And the price is typically very high. And frequently requires the shedding of blood. But number two, God wanted to let them know that blood, and especially the blood of an innocent animal or whatever, always gets God's attention. So when he saw that blood covering the Hebrew homes, the entrance to their homes, I'm sorry, he would pass over them and they'd be untouched from this tenth plague. And that is such a remarkable, beautiful picture of what it takes to keep God from entering our homes, as it were, our lives, our souls, and condemning us to hell, because that's what we deserve, being sinners. God must see the blood of His Son applied to our souls. In Colossians 2, verse 14, Paul said we have redemption, literally release, liberation, through His blood, and it's only through the blood of Jesus Christ. 
But that can only happen. The blood can only be applied to our souls when we are in Christ. Ephesians 2 verse 13, Paul said, But now in Christ, you who were once far off, that is far away from God, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. That only happens when we're in Christ. And did you know the Bible only teaches one way to get into Jesus Christ? If you can find another way, I'd love to see it. We get into Christ when we're baptized in response to our faith and willingness to repent and confess Jesus. We read from Romans chapter 6 this morning. Well, let me go to Galatians chapter 3, 26 and 27. Paul wrote, For you are all sons of God through faith, that's the core, through faith in Christ Jesus. And then he explained, because this is what people of faith will do. For as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have, been, have put on Christ. There's no other way, given the New Testament, to get into Christ other than the faith response of baptism. And when God sees that blood applied to us as we're in Christ, He passes over, as it were. All right, let's go back to chapter 12 and pick up at verse 29. And it came to pass at midnight that the Lord struck all the firstborn in the land of Egypt from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on the throne to the firstborn of the captive who was in his dungeon and all the firstborn of livestock. So Pharaoh rose in the night. He, all his servants, and all the Egyptians. And there was a great cry in Egypt for there was not a house where there was not one dead. I want you to think about that this plague resulted not only from the stubbornness of Pharaoh. He could have avoided this. But it also resulted because of his cruelty toward the Hebrews. Toward the taskmasters who abused them so much. And his ordering the murder of all the male babies of the Hebrews. God was taking vengeance for what Pharaoh had done. But I also want you to note this. The consequence of Pharaoh's sin didn't just affect him. It affected his family, obviously his firstborn son, and everyone in the nation. Just as Adam and Eve's sin affected this whole planet and everyone on it, so did Pharaoh's sin have widespread repercussions. And there's a lesson for us that the consequences of our sins frequently affect, hurt others. I can say with 110% honesty if there's such a thing that my deepest regrets in life have come as a result of my own decisions, bad decisions and sins that have hurt others. It's hard to get over that. It's hard to forgive yourself when what you do has ramifications on the lives of others. I've heard people at times say something like this. Well, my sin, what I'm doing is my business, is not hurting any, anyone else. Think again. So many people who believe that are mistaken, badly mistaken. And I pray God will open their eyes to the fact that they're affecting others by their own sins before it's too late. But let's continue. Verse 31 then he, Pharaoh, called for Moses and Aaron by night. Because this has happened throughout Egypt. It's woken every family up. And said, just as God predicted, God said, he'll drive you out of the land. So he said, rise, go out from among my people. We'd say, get out of here. Both you and the children of Israel. And go serve the Lord as you said. Also take your flocks and your herds as you have said and be gone. And then the most remarkable thing was he add to it and bless me. Bless me also? What are you saying, Pharaoh? You're saying, what? Uh, restore my son? Bring him back to life? Oh, give me a replacement? What's he trying to say? It's too late. 
It's like Moses looking. I could just see out of Moses' heart saying, you've had nine chances. God has given you every opportunity to avoid this. And now? Now you want a blessing? I wonder how many people are just like Pharaoh. Who when they begin to suffer the consequences for their bad decisions, or specifically for the sins, they just say, no, hold it, hold it, God. Hold it, hold it. Uh, uh, can't we talk this over? Can, can we... Can I go back? Can I do a redo? Do over? No. Can you imagine the millions, no billions, who stand before God at the judgment, unprepared, and say, God, please give me just one more chance. Please give me some blessing here before it's all gone. There's a song. I, I regret we don't have it in our books. Um, but it's, it's a song you know. I'll just read the lyrics. And this, this song would come, as it were, from the lips of many, oh, I'm sorry, directed toward many at the judgment. Almost persuaded now to believe, almost persuaded Christ to receive. Seems now some soul to say, oh, go spirit, go thy way. Some more convenient day I knew I'll call. Almost persuaded. Come, come today. Almost persuaded. Turn not away. Jesus invites you here. Angels are lingering near. Prayers rise from hearts so dear. Oh, wander, come. Almost persuaded. Harvest is past. Almost persuaded. Doom comes at last. Almost cannot avail. Almost is but to fail. Sad, sad. That bitter wail. Almost! Lost. Verse 4. <coughs> now the sojourn of the children of Israel who lived in Egypt was 430 years. And it came to pass at the end of the 430 years on that very same day, it came to pass that all the armies of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. Interesting that they're referred to as the armies of the Lord. But maybe not that unusual. What is an army? It's an organized force serving under a commander. And that's what Israel was. And that's what we are. Love that song, Soldiers of Christ Arise. And that's what we are. Paul told Timothy, 2 Timothy 2, 3 and 4, You therefore must endure hardship as a soldier of Jesus Christ. We are in the Lord's army. No one entangled in warfare or tangles, entangles himself with the affairs of this life that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. I want to finish at chapter 13. And verse 3. And Moses said to the people, Remember this day. Remember this day. In which you went out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, for by strength of hand the Lord brought you out of this place. And to help make sure they would never forget, ever, Moses instituted the observance, as Don pointed out, of the Passover, the greatest of all the Jewish feasts, which Orthodox Jews still celebrate today, 34 centuries later. And in accordance with the will and command of Jesus, we partake of the first day of the week, the Lord's Supper, because Jesus instituted the Lord's Supper from that very feast, 14 centuries later from the time that feast was given. And as Don said, why do we partake? To remember. To remember the price Jesus paid to set us free. You know, thinking about that, wouldn't it be a good idea, and I, I believe it would be, for every one of us to remember the day 
that we were set free by the blood of Jesus when we obeyed the gospel. I hope you know that date. It may be in, on a baptismal certificate, written in a Bible, recorded somewhere. And I hope you'll put that date on your calendars. If you're like me, I keep up with things on my phone, on my phone calendar. And you know on Wednesday nights, when we love to mention the birthdays for that week, if it's your spiritual birthday, just raise your hand, we'd be glad to announce that. You know, I'll tell you, one of my big regrets in life is my baptismal certificate was lost decades ago. And I don't know the exact day I was baptized into Christ. I think the closest I can come up with is May 8, 1966. But it's good to remember the day when you were set free from your sins. Or to rephrase Exodus 13, 3, remember the day in which you went out of Satan's dominion, out of the house of bondage. For by His blood, the Lord brought you out of that place. Praise God. Amen? Is there anybody here tonight still under Satan's control? Struggling with guilt? Struggling with the weight of sin? Jesus really is waiting to set you free. This can be your day of independence. Won't you accept Him? Won't you repent of your sins? Confess Him as the Son of God? Be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit? Paul wrote to the Corinthian church, Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. 2 Corinthians 6, verse 2. If you're not a Christian... I urge you, don't put it off. Don't put it off. Come to Jesus today. Come to Jesus tonight. If you need our prayers, please come. Let us pray for you. If you need to respond to the invitation, would you come right now as we stand and sing the song?